Johannes, good morning. We have today our friends from India are participating. These are eminent scientists and researchers who we have for the first time been able to cordially invite and they have accepted our invitation to participate in this. You will also meet them on Saturday and more depth. So today we're going to move on to the IT. Conda. Conda. Usually I describe myself as a messenger of ancient Indian thought. So now my real master, these are my Today we're gonna, this morning we're gonna be looking into the effects uh, and influence that emotions play on attention and the memory. And we are very honored that uh, Professor Elizabeth Felt is coming from the uni University of New York. She's there at the <coughs> Department of Psychology and Neural Science, and her work has been groundbreaking in the investigation of how the human brain processes emotion and how that particularly affects learning, memory and decision making. So please Liz, it's yours. Thank you. So Your Holiness, before we begin, I want to say it's an honor to be able to participate in this dialogue with you today. And um, I want to thank you in advance for your attention and consideration. So I'm going to talk to you today about emotion and its impact on attention and memory. And just to give you a brief outline, I'm going to start just talking a little bit, very briefly, about what emotion is and why we have emotion. Then I'm going to move on to talk about emotion and its influence on attention, and then emotion and its influence on memory. And at the very end, I'll talk a little bit about how our thoughts can influence our emotions and how this might relate back to memory and attention. So I've heard a lot in this meeting so far about the destructive nature of emotion. Um, but emotion also has some very important functions that are, uh, that are necessary for human survival. So in this picture here, as you can see, the fear this woman feels uh, will motivate her to take actions to protect herself. And here's an example of a young mother looking at her infant, and the joy and love that she feels may inspire her to care for this child when it's difficult. So emotion is a signal. It tells us what's potentially relevant or important, and this can help motivate us to take appropriate actions. And because emotion is so important in how we function in the world, it should, by definition, influence our attention, memory, and our thoughts. If we look at the brain, it seems to be designed to do just this. So I'm going to talk today quite a bit about this region right here in red. It's called the amygdala. And this slide here shows a diagram of connections throughout the brain. And what this part here looks like is somewhat like, I come from the island of Manhattan in New York. This looks a little bit like Grand Central Station, which is our main train station. Um, the amygdala is widely connected to a number of regions throughout the brain. And in a way, this allows the amygdala, when something emotional comes along, it allows the amygdala to influence the rest of the brain. To, to change our thoughts, our attention, and our memory. I'm going to talk today about how the amygdala does just that. So before I begin, um, I want to talk a little bit about what affective scientists think of when they think of emotion. Now, I, I think you and I um, and others in this room could talk for an hour or a day or maybe a month about what emotion is. I'd like to postpone that conversation until the discussion section, if we could. Um, I just want to tell you that affective scientists, people like me who study emotion, know emotion is not one thing. There are a number of parts of an emotional response, and so I'm just going to briefly review what some of those aspects are. So usually when we use the term emotion, we're talking about our subjective feeling, what we think, how, we, how our, um, our consciousness is feeling at that time. Um, and that's part of emotion, but it's just one component of emotion. When we have an emotional response, our body also responds. We can, for instance, increase our heart rate, 
uh, we might sweat a little bit. Stress hormones will run through our body. We will also express this emotion in our face or our voice, for instance. And the emotion will motivate us to take particular actions, perhaps to approach something or withdraw from something. And another very important component of emotion, which I'm going to get to a little bit more later, is this notion of appraisal. To initiate an emotion, we have to evaluate the situation, interpret the situation, um, and that helps us determine what the right emotional response should be in that circumstance. <laughs> So I'm going to move on right now to talk about emotion and attention, the first topic um, that I'm going to cover. I'm going to make two points in this section. The first, emotion has two, two uh, distinct roles in attention, modulating attention. One is it aids attention and perception for emotional events. At the same time, these emotional events capture our attention, so it's harder for us to observe and attend to non-emotional events. So I'm going to give you just a little example of the first, um, the first function of emotion um, and attention. So this is from yesterday's tea break. Um, and as you can see, Sonia is engaged in a conversation with Cliff. Myla is talking to Sonia. Now Sonia is close to Cliff, and if she chose to, she could hear what Cliff is saying. Instead, she is using her attention to focus on what Myla is saying in this noisy room. And that's what attention does. It helps us select some things to pay attention to and other things to ignore because they're not relevant. If, however, Cliff were to start to say something about Sonia, she might hear her name, even though she's trying to ignore Cliff. She can't ignore something <laughs> relevant coming through. <laughs> So in this way, emotion, something that's emotional and meaning for us to, to, meaningful to us will break through our limited attentional resources even when we're not trying to pay attention to it. In the laboratory, we study this effect with something, uh, with the attentional blink, which you heard about from Ann Treisman. Um, so again, the way this, this paradigm works is a number of stimuli, in this case their words, are presented very quickly. And we ask people, in this case, to tell us the words that are in, in green ink and ignore the ones that are in black ink. And people are pretty good at doing this, unless this second word, what we call it the second target word, comes very soon after the first target word. When this happens, people often miss the second target word. And that's because noticing this word and encoding this word and attending to this word takes some resources, which are then limited. the <laughs> So in terms of time, temporal mm -hmm. distance, how much? So this, this, is about, this is about 300, 400 milliseconds, and here we're looking at 500, 700 milliseconds. Mm -hmm. And so is, is this simply because of the attentional blink? Factor? Yeah, this is the this is the attentional blink effect. Okay. Yes, this is the same but thing. It has nothing that to do with the emotive content of the word. No, it has nothing to do with the word, except what we did in this case was sometimes the second word was an emotional word, as in the, as in the word rape, and sometimes it was a neutral word. So when we did that, what we found was a pattern like this. So um, here is when there are neutral words, you often miss the word, the second word, in the early leg period, a little bit late when it comes later, a little bit less when it comes later on. When it's, however, an emotional word, and it could be negative or positive, 
what we see is we do better. And this is very similar to the pattern that Anne Treisman showed you with meditation. So here, just changing the emotional quality of the words instead of meditation has the same impact on the attentional blank. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, this, is a, this is with patients with damage to the amygdala, that brain region that I showed you earlier in red. What you see is here, this is the percent of times they reported this, the second target word. There was no difference if the word was neutral or emotional. They failed to show this enhanced response in the intentional link effect which da- with damage to the amygdala. So this tells us the amygdala mediates this facilitation this, of attention with emotion. And when we think about how this happens, um, we know something about the amygdala's connectivity with, with the rest of the brain. So the amygdala, this, this region back here, is the visual cortex. And the amygdala gets information from the visual cortex very quickly and early on in sensory processing. It then feeds information back to the visual cortex, um, if telling the visual cortex if something is emotionally significant. So if you show somebody faces with a fear expression, you will see enhanced amygdala activation. You will also see enhanced activation in early, visu- early regions of the visual cortex. Um, and if you damage the amygdala, you fail to see more amygdala activation in the visual cortex. What's interesting about this is, is this response we see that depends on the amygdala in the visual cortex for emotional faces occurs even in these regions in the very back that we know are necessary for simple perceptual functions. So I'm not going to demonstrate for you a simple perceptual function called contrast. I'm going to show you a little um, circle. And there are going to be some lines in the circle. And they're going to be tilted to the right or the left. And I would like to know if they're tilted to the right or the left. We'll ask Diego to answer. Very good. (laughs) <laughs> How about this one? Right. Good. How about that one? Confused? Okay. <laughs> no, it's left. Yeah. It's left, you yeah. can see. It's very hard to see on this one on the bottom. Well, and the reason the is... Take the yellow chota, yellow chota. That's every time I do it. No, it's clear. Yellow, yellow yeah. chota. Take two. Yeah. Yeah. Two, two. Can you, can you see? I think the screen is very small. Because, you know... Well, I tried to make it hard, so don't feel bad if you can't see. Um, the point I wanted to make with this, th- these, these uh, patches vary in what we call contrast, which is the differentiation between the light and the d- dark shades. And contrast is a perceptual function that happens very early in visual processing. Prior to, you need contrast even to tech lines. Um, and we wanted to see... So given that we know that emotion affects processing, even in these very early visual areas, we wanted to see, does emotion, um, <clears throat> does emotion influence our ability to pick up on very subtle perceptual cues like contrast? So we did an experiment, something like this. Participants looked at a, a cross on the screen, then they were flashed a face, and then a patch like this, and they had to tell us, are the lines tilted to the right or to the left? And we varied across trials both um, the emotional qualities of the face, it was either a face that had a fear expression or a face with a neutral expression, and the co- amount of contrast in the, little, in the patches that we showed. And we determined, by doing this over a number of trials, how much contrast the participants needed to be able to detect the orientation of the lines when it was preceded by a fearful face or a neutral face. No. And what we found was something like this. Um, When one of these patches was preceded by a fearful face, you needed much less contrast to be able to detect the orientations of the line than when it was preceded by a neutral face. Emotion dramatic. 
<音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音
define emotion. So in this case, so something about the amygdala that's very interesting, um, and, and as I mentioned earlier, we can talk about how you define emotion for hours. So, so maybe, so, so uh, no, but I, I want to answer this particular question because I would like to talk about this. Um, I just want to be able to finish the rest of the talk, but um, the amygdala is not a region that seems to be necessary for your feeling. It actually seems to be a region that responds in the presence of something emotional that then sends a signal out to let you, the rest of the brain determine, is this important? So the feeling may come after that. So in this case, of course, you, know, you probably didn't have a strong emotional response in seeing those faces. But those faces are a signal that something's potentially important. You don't know yet whether it is important. But because it's potentially important, the brain should now pay more attention to that to determine if it really is important and something that is necessary to elicit a whole emotional response. Then the amygdala is strong, emotional. 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 So, um, so for example, like if the amygdala is um, signaling something emotionally relevant, important uh, mm -hmm. event, um, does that necessarily imply that it is important to you, to the person who is experiencing or can't one have emotional you know emotion with relation to someone else that is completely other than other focused like say altruism or compassion sure absolutely so the the, the so I mean, that may not be relevant to the survival or the well-being of the individual, of the individual. Yeah. no so it's it, not self it is not self focused or it's not self it doesn't have to be self focused but you know you decide what's relevant to you so if, you, if it is important to you, you know, to be altruistic or compassionate, that still is relevant to you. Okay. So I want to now move on to emotion and memory, um, to talk about how emotion might influence our memories. And here I'm going to be talking about long-term declarative memory, um, the memories that we have for days or weeks or years. And before I get into um, what emotion does to memory, I want to talk a little bit about the structure of memory. So memory really has three stages. The first stage we call encoding. And this is when you first... So can you explain encoding? Yes. This is, this is when we first encounter information. So this is just the first time I see you, that's, I'm encoding a memory of you. Um, so this is just when we first encounter information. Um, once we've encountered information, we store the memory. This is a passive stage because we aren't doing anything. It is just in our minds and our brains, waiting for the next stage, which is retrieval. So emotion can influence. Yeah. So retrieval is simply when we now recall the memories later. We want to bring them back to mind. So emotion can influence all three stages of memory independently. So I'm going to go through them one by one. I'm not going to say much about the first stage because essentially the, f the first stage, what happens in encoding that influences memory, is the same thing that happens with attention. The more we pay attention to something, the more likely we are to remember it later. So I've already told you what emotion does to attention. What it does is it gives us enhanced processing for the highly emotional events and impaired processing for the other events that are around. So for instance, in this situation, you probably are hardly noticing the architecture of this building. So emotions influence on encoding are the same as attention, which is 
It allows us better, a better ability to take in information that's central and emotionally important and less of an ability to take in information that isn't as important. Storage, so storage to you and me seems like a very passive process. However, we know in the brain it's not so passive. There are changes that are happening in the brain over time that make memories become more or less stable. So a lot of the things that we encounter, we forget. But some of the things we don't. Um, if you were to, for instance, bump your head and have a concussion, what might happen is you might forget some things that, that happened right beforehand. And this is because this storage process of memory was interrupted. So there's a period of time after you encounter something where the memory becomes set in your mind. And this is a storage process we call consolidation. Emotion influences this storage process. So in an experiment we did, we showed people pictures like this, sort of neutral scenes of, of people interacting. And later on, they were shown pictures like this again and other pictures, ones they have seen before, ones they haven't seen before. And we asked them both immediately after they saw the pictures and then also a week later, did you see these pictures before or did you not? And what we saw for the neutral pictures was um, a pattern that you might expect. Immediately when we asked them, they remembered quite a few of the pictures. When we waited a week, however, they forgot quite a few. Um, this, is, this happens all the time in memory. We forget things over time. We also had included pictures that were highly emotional, like this one. Here, what we saw immediately, they also were very good at remembering which pictures they'd seen before. However, they didn't forget the pictures at the same rate. They seemed to hold on to them a little bit more strongly. <laughs> We know this is because of the interaction of the amygdala here in red and this yellow region here called the hippocampus. So the hippocampus is a part of the brain that's very important for memory overall. If you have damage to this part of the brain, you won't remember almost anything. Um, if I, you, know, you wouldn't remember uh, five minutes from now that we had this conversation or a day. What we know happens when you encounter events here, they have to be events that are highly arousing because this, this effect is completely due to the stress hormones that occur when you uh, encounter an emotional event. The amygdala responds to these hormones and it influences the storage processes in this region, the hippocampus. Um, and this is why memories that are highly emotional are retained okay. over time. Stress hormone junction release, DGN, no one did tempenalia, temponeros. The two words. Okay. All right. So emotion enhances memory storage. Emotion also has an impact on this final stage of memory, which is when we recall it. So you probably remember where you were when you heard about the attacks of 9 11. Um, most people have fairly vivid memories of that day. Um, emotion, so memory is not just coming up with information again, but the, when you come up with this information, it has a quality to it. It can have a sense of vividness, it can have a sense of detail. Um, you can feel like you're recollecting it as if you're reliving the experience. Or it can just seem like something that happened before. It can seem somewhat familiar, but you don't really remember all the details. Memories for highly emotional events like this one are usually recollected with a strong sense of vividness, a sense of confidence that the memory is, is right and it has detail. Okay. So what's somewhat surprising about studies that have looked at memories for events like 9-11 um, is that even though individuals have this strong sense of vividness and confidence that their memories are right, they're not always so right in all the details. So let me give you an example of an experiment that was done. 
Um, a day after the terrorist attacks of 9-11, uh, students were brought into the laboratory and they were asked to write down what happened when they heard about the terrorist attacks of 9-11, and also to write down another event that had occurred that day or the day before. So for instance, if they'd gotten together with some friends to study for an exam, um, they might recall their study section. So the day after 9-11, they were asked to describe the events in detail for the terrorist attacks and the study session they had with their friends. A year later, they were brought back a, day, um, a, a year later, they were brought back to the laboratory and they were asked to write down their recollections of both the events of 9-11 um, and the study session. What they found was the memories for 9-11, although they were accurate in the details for what had happened that day in terms of the terrorist attack, they were no more accurate in the other details. So for instance, where they were, who they heard it from, um, then memories for the study section. Both of the memories, for, the memories for details declined over time for both types of memories. So what differed between the memories for the study section and for 9-11 was that the subjects were highly confident that their details for the 9-11 memories were correct. It's very hard to convince somebody that they're wrong about what they recollect that day. Um, but nevertheless, their details were not correct. For the other memories, they, didn't, they weren't confident in the details. It seemed like a distant memory and they didn't have any confidence that they were correct about what they were saying. So this tells us that emotion increases our confidence in our memory accuracy, perhaps even more than it increases our memory accuracy. So if we want to think about why this is the case, we can look at the brain to give us some, some um, hints. <laughs> Okay. So first let's think about why this might be the case. So if you remember, when we see something highly emotional like this, what we do is we, we focus on it, so we encode this aspect of the memory very well. And because it's highly arousing, we store it better. So we have a very strong memory for the central important details that occurred that day. What we don't have is a strong memory for all these other details that occurred that day. We did an imaging study where we asked people, we put people in the scanner and we asked them to recall their memories of 9-11. Um, and we also asked them to think to recall memories of other life events that had occurred. So here's an example of a few of the memories. And these, are, these were all people, so New York University is fairly close to the World Trade Center. So these were all people that um, experienced it that day. Um, and so these were some of the memories. So one person said, the explosion caused everyone in the area to automatically duck for cover. I saw some scaffolding that I could go under to avoid the falling debris. Another person said, I saw with my own eyes the towers burning in red flames, noises and cries of people. The other events that came up from their life were things like a birthday party or perhaps moving to New York for the very first time. When we compared memories for um, 
the recollections of 9-11 versus the other life events, we found greater activation in the amygdala and less activation in the parahippocampus, um, which Anne talked about yesterday. So let me go into, th let me go into this a little so bit more. So can you explain the significance of this? Yes, now? I will. Yeah. Um, so if you remember, the amygdala I talked about is a brain region that allows us to focus the attention and then stores that memory strongly. So this tells us when people are coming up with these memories, they're giving us very strong memories for these details. The parahippocampus, this is a region that Anne spoke about. It's right here in blue um, that Anne spoke about in her talk. And if you remember, when people were looking at houses, um, they saw activation in the parahippocampus. This is a region, they call it a place area. So it actually is important in encoding a lot of details of the context of what's occurring. Um, and the fact that they have less activation of this, re of this region suggests they have less memory for the details of the context um, when they're recalling these memories. So we're seeing a trade-off. So you actually are saying, I'm highly confident in the memory, um, in its details, but you're saying that because what you have is a very strong memory for a few central details and actually worse memory for all of the details of the context. So the better hippocampus is the level of chance is to be able to do it. The reason is that the person who is in the world is the person who is in the world, the person who is in the world, the activation of yogurt is the level of chance. The reason is that the 9-11 is the level of chance. The level of chance is the level of chance. The level of chance is the level of chance. I mean, there are the people who are very happy to be able to do this. I mean, there are the people who are very happy to be able to do this. But in 9-11, there are the people who are very happy to be able to do this. There are the people who are very happy to be able to do this. So these are different uh, locations, localities in the brain. Yes. So the place where we see the increase is here, and the place where we see the decrease is here. And this is a region we know that's important when you, experience, when you uh, encounter potentially important events that allows us to focus attention and store the, those, those details, those important details more strongly. This is a region that we know is important in encoding a lot of details of the scene. And so what we think is happening here is that your very strong memories for a few details is misleading you to think that you have a strong memory for all of the details when perhaps you actually don't. So what I've told you about emotion and memory is that emotion enhances the storage of events um, so that the, the amygdala here actually influences the hippocampus to make sure that events are stored better over time um, and that it increases confidence in memory accuracy more than accuracy. So we may not actually remember all the details of the emotional events, but sometimes we think we do. Um, and you might wonder why this is the case. Why would we have a system of memory where we don't actually remember the details, but actually we think we do. And if we think about what memory does, memory is a guide from the past to help us act in the future. Um, and when something's highly emotional, it's probably important that we remember that emotional event, but not so important that we remember the details. And the confidence you have in your memory helps, helps you be sure about your memory. And so in an emotional situation, you may want to act quickly. You may not want to have to question whether your memory is correct, even if it's detailed, because probably if it's highly emotional, the details aren't what's so important. Um, so, so, the, so the implication here is that if the memory is mm -hmm. not that of an, a strongly emotional kind of you know, content, then there will be... Um, uh, greater accuracy in remembering the details? Is that the implication? So sometimes, I mean, so sometimes there's greater accuracy in the details for, for um, neutral events. Often what you find is not much of a difference in the details Hello. for the neutral and emotional events, but people think the details are better Hello. for the emotional events. Hello. Detailia, Nick Penzuniga, Tampa Sable Mene, Emotion Shukshin Puyuniki, Chumandalia, the details to get the Tarang in some something easy shukshiris. Kansa Tampa Pusuzungan, the dig, the Moranega, there is a Tampa Pusuzungan, Yishim Yongo Jumzaka is in a Maumbalia, and Tedan Tedan Rabu 
The truth is, you know, over time we usually forget most of the details of neutral events anyways. So. All right, I want to um, now move on to the final part of my talk, which is to talk about the relationship between thoughts and emotion. So our thoughts play an important role in generating emotion, and here I'm getting back to what I hinted at the very beginning, this notion of appraisal. How we interpret an event or evaluate an event um, is important in the emotional response that we have. Um, and I'm also going to suggest that our thoughts can both increase and decrease our brain's response to emotional events. But just to give you an example of the relationship between thoughts and emotion, um, as you can see, here we have two cats looking at the same dog. Um, this cat, however, sees this as a mean, potentially threatening dog. This cat, however, sees this as a perhaps playful dog that could be its friend. Now, why these two cats have different interpretations of the dog, I don't know. It could be that this cat had a bad experience with the dog in the past and this cat didn't. Perhaps this cat was born being somewhat more fearful than this cat. Perhaps this cat has a meditative practice and this one does not. <laughs> um, but the point I want to make here is that uh, how we think about something can change the emotional response we have. Um, and this is true uh, both in our behavior and in our brain. So this is, gets back to the term appraisal that we talk about in emotion research. Um, anytime we encounter something, we have to say, is this relevant to me in this circumstance, or how am I going to make this relevant to me in this circumstance? And we have a choice here in what we do. Um, and this just isn't how we, uh, this doesn't just apply to our feelings, but also to our brain's response to emotional events. So this is one way that we show um, how thought can increase your brain's response to emotional events. So this is the type of experiment we do in the laboratory. We bring people in, we show them something neutral, like a blue square. And then we do something that's not very nice. We give them a, lot, a little shock to the wrist. It doesn't hurt too much. Lord it's a little test. electric shock, yes. Shock test, yeah. Then the experiment, it's short take. I promise you it's not so bad. <laughs> <laughs> so then, so can you describe, yeah. The shock? No, no, can you just, so how, <laughs> uh, what happens afterwards? I'm sorry, can you say What happens afterwards? Oh, okay. yeah. So what happens is, so initially they see the blue square and they get a mild shock to the wrist. And when they get the mild shock, they get a little nervous. That's what these little dots here, that's sweating. Um, and eventually they just have to see the blue square and they, they start to sweat a little bit. Um, so they know, they learn that the blue square predicts that they might get a shock. This is simple Pavlovian conditioning. Uh, much the ways Pavlov described with a bell ringing and a dog getting food. You're, you have this automatic body response to something fearful, which is a little bit of sweating. Um, and now the blue square by itself, because it was paired with a shock, elicits that same emotional response. What's interesting is I don't have to actually give you a shock to elicit, to have the, emotion, the blue square elicit an emotional response. I can just tell you that when you see a blue square, you might get a shock. I never actually have to give you a shock. Um, and the, the emotional response that I see in the participants looks almost identical. So in this case, what you have is no direct experience. You have this symbolic conceptual knowledge of the relationship between the blue square and the shock. When I look at the brain in both of these circumstances, so here's what I see, here's the amygdala here. And here's what I see when they're looking at the blue square that was paired with shock. Um, here's what I see, here's the amygdala here. And here's what I see when I tell them that the blue square means you might get a shock. The brain looks almost identical in these two circumstances. And this tells you how our thoughts can generate emotional responses much in the same way actual um, aversive experience can. We can also diminish our emotional response. So doing something very similar. Now, again, in this experiment, we pair a blue square with a shock. We also have another stimulus here, a yellow square that never gets paired with shock. On some trials, I ask participants just to attend to their natural feelings when they see the blue square or they see the yellow square. On other trials, before they see the blue or the yellow square, I ask them now to regulate 
to try to think about it differently, to change their emotional response. And the way we, we do this is before we do the experiment, we say, when you see the blue square, and I ask you now to regulate your emotional response, I want you to try to use that color to think of an image for you that's calming, an, an image from nature. So now, instead of, when you see the word regular, instead of thinking about the fact that you might get a shock, think about this image that you came up with that's calming to you. And this is what I see. So here, what I've plotted, this is essentially a measure of your skin that tells me subtle differences in sweating. And here's the, the amount of sweating you have to the blue square that means you might get a shock, and the yellow square that means you won't get a shock. When I'm asking you now to just attend to your natural feelings, or try to regulate your emotional response. And we see, we don't get much... <laughs> So here, I've plotted this sweating response. We call it the skin conductance response. That's what it stands for, SCR. And what you can see is they sweat more when they think they might get a shock in both cases. But when they're attending to the emotional response, I mean, attending to the fact that they might get a shock, they sweat even more than when now they're trying to regulate their emotional response. So here, some year research. Year research. here, in, when they use this imagery strategy, they can decrease at least their body's emotional response. When I look at the brain, so here I'm, I'm just looking at the amygdala, um, here, this response here. This is how the amygdala responds when I, I ask them to attend to their natural feelings, the fact that they might get a shock, and we see an increase in response here. When I ask them now to regulate their emotional response, we actually see a decrease in the amygdala response. However, the amygdala is not acting by itself. The amygdala is connected to a number of brain regions, as I told you. So we actually, what we saw was not just the amygdala decreasing its response, but a circuit of brain regions became involved. We saw greater activation in this region, what we call the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, when participants engaged in this regulation strategy. And this is the same region that Amishi talked about and Adele talked about as being important in executive control. So it's almost as if when they see these stimuli, and I'm asking them now to think about it differently, they're having to use these executive processes to help it reinterpret the stimulus. This region shows connections to another region here, which we call the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. This is a region that we know has strong connections with the amygdala and is capable of actually inhibiting responses in the amygdala in a number of different paradigms. And these two regions are connected to each other. And we think both of these regions work in conjunction now with diminishing the amygdala response, and in this case, at least the body's expression of the emotional response. So just to sum up this last part, I've suggested to you that our thoughts play an important role in generating emotion. How we appraise a situation or interpret a situation determines our emotional response. Um, and that our thought, thoughts can increase or decrease the brain's response to emotional events. So how we interpret the significance of events can increase or decrease the amygdala response. And through the interactions with the prefrontal cortex, um, this gives us a pathway for thoughts to influence the amygdala. Um, and I just left, I have one question to finish up that we can talk about in the discussion. So I wanted to ask you, do you think analytic meditation has effects similar to emotion regulation? Definitely, yeah. yeah. And if, of course, you know, depends on what we mean by meditation, the word meditation. Mm. Well, I'm, I'm leaving that up to you. 
For example, if you uh, meditate on an object of desire and cultivate that familiarity, it will increase your attachment. <laughs> Which is, you know, and if a you, form of emotion regulation, yeah. perhaps not what you want And to if you focus, you know, single-pointedly on an object of hatred, then it could enhance your hatred. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, emotion regulation, as I showed you, can both increase and decrease fear. You know, how we choose to use it is really up to us. And then the question becomes, and this is not something we've looked at, um, whether either emotion regulation or analytic meditation might influence emotions impact on attention, memory, and the choices we make. But I don't know if, uh, if, if you have any insights into how that might occur. analytic meditation emotion regulation so uh, generally speaking, we can even within the emotions, you can make a distinction between those that are somehow grounded in reason, some kind of rationale, mm -hmm. and some that are much more reactive. But I also think that you know our our the way that we interpret events can in, can actually ahead of time when we come to a situation will change our immediate reaction. So I think you know when we say that. It's, I don't think it's the case that the reason is only dealing with things after the fact. I think how we approach a situation can, ahead of time. That's true. That's very true. All right. And finally, I just want to thank you again for this dialogue today. Thank you, Liz. Um, I think it might be helpful to sort of clarify if for the following discussion, if both sides of the discussion are understanding the same thing in emotion. Maybe that okay. would be a, a little bracket that we can open before we make a break. So just that afterwards in the discussion, we really talk about the same thing. Mm -hmm. So would some of you, maybe Alan, would you I would love for Liz to begin because a very important point here is that in Tibetan, as we've learned years ago, uh, it, with all of the sophistication and detail of terms for very specific mental processes, as as Rupert filled it in the, the other day, but there's a lot more detail that he didn't have time to go into. For all the detail that is there, there is no single term in, in either modern Tibetan or the classic Tibetan that is a we very have in the modern with, with the Tibetan. With modern minus Tibetan, the, we have. And what is that? Not in the classical. Nyongso. Yeah. And so, but in the classic, you know, in the classic presentation, there is no term that corresponds closely to emotion. So I think if we're going to initiate such a discussion, it would really be good if you, uh, if you could fill, it in, fill us in on that. Um, and if I, if I could just give one suggestion of what something you might touch on is compassion, is as obviously very central to the whole Buddhist endeavor. Some people believe that compassion is an emotion. Some would say it's not an emotion, it is actually an, a, a more of a cognitive state, one of aspiration and yearning, which is conjoined with emotion. But if, uh, but if you could just simply address, clarify for all of us here, no. what you mean no. by emotion, and what, what, what emotions would be the demarcations of what is and isn't. It's emotions and what is and isn't. It's not emotions and what is and isn't. It's not emotions and emotions and what is even in Sanskrit, I don't have. I don't. I don't think there is a term for emotion. Modern they use bhavana, but in classic. Microphone, please. Yomari, Yomari. I'll say that just for the record, and that is in the classical Sanskrit. There is no, no uh, corresponding term, in, uh, but there is, they take from the classical and in the more modern usage of classical, then bhavana? Bhavana. Bhavana. I mean, there, there are words in Sanskrit. Bhava. Bhava, stai bhava, that mean, that the, the Sanskrit, that they use for motion. Give the microphone. Give the microphone. <laughs> yeah. Vesna Vallas is a Sanskrit scholar, so that's why we're reaching out. Otherwise, yeah. I would not encourage that. Yes. Well, yeah, as uh, Rupert mentioned, there is a term bhava, but 
really began to designate emotion only from the 10th century on with the uh, introduction of Dharma Shastra and uh, dramatic uh, sentiments and uh, emotions introduced. But we don't have evidence that before that designated emotion. Well, 10th century is fairly early. So, 10th so, century is fairly early. So. So maybe I could. So uh, list, uh, actually, bhavana is uh, bhavana. Is, no, please, Bhava. please. We want Bhava. we want to bring that. So now yeah, to I know. I, maybe I could give a yes. sort of a brief answer, and then, um, which is not going to be satisfactory. I don't think. I think it's interesting to me that there is no single term for emotion because I think, in the way that we think about emotion in uh, Western science, it's almost a hindrance to have a single term for emotion because it really isn't one thing. Um, and so even today, in the talk I gave the different effects I talked about, different components of what I call emotion underlie those effects. So when I talked about emotion enhancing the storage, I know that's completely due to the physiological arousal response that you get, which is a component of emotion. When I talked about attention, the effects on attention, there it's really a signaling of something potentially important that isn't related to physiological arousal. So emotion theorists have had quite a difficult time coming up with even defining what emotion is, and it's never one thing. It's many, many things. Um, and so we call the, the, the main theories of emotion component models of emotion because we break emotion down into its component. If we had to, th um, if we had to think of you know, one thing that holds all of these things together is that I would, I would say it's something about signaling what's important to us, um, what's relevant to us. Um, and so to me, you know, the category of emotion somehow has something to do with s signaling what's relevant or what's important. Um, but it, there's a number of different ways that it's expressed, a number of different ways that it's done, um, and it's quite confusing to try to come up with all the different details of the things that comprise emotion. And I think it's been difficult for Western science because, because people don't mean the same thing when they talk about it often. And we, it, it, the fact that we have one word to describe so many things um, kind of lets us talk past each other at times. Richard, do you want to answer this? Richard, Richie, you uh, want to make a... Well, I, I wanted to actually ask the, um, the Buddhist scholars in, in the... Um, in, in some systems of the Abhidharma, at least as I understand it, for each, um, uh, th there, there is a, um, uh, one of the mental factors uh, concerns positive, negative, or neutral, and that is regarded as an omnipresent mental factor. Yeah, a vedana, feeling, yeah. yeah. Feeling. It's translated as feeling. Uh, and so, so. Uh, uh, I would like to ask so you're talking about it, um, um, positive, negative in the sense of how it is felt, rather than uh, ethically, uh, rather not ethically from not ethic from an ethical point of view, positive, negative, but rather from the point of view of joyful, pleasant, unpleasant. Pleasant. That's what you meant. Yes. Okay, Risha. Yes, and and so if if that is the case, what is the Buddhist understanding of? what that positive and negative is actually referring to. Uh, is it uh, some affective um, uh, coloring or tone to the mental process? Uh, uh, or uh, is it some other quality which um, has not yet been, been fully described here? <laughs> The <laughs> Kangsol, 
So generally uh, speaking, Nurse, so, of course, this is his own sort of saying that this is his own take on this. Um, when we uh, bring up concepts like feeling um, in the Buddhist context, uh, one, needs to we need, one needs to understand this because it's, a, it's an activity. So one needs to understand it in terms of an agent that experiences it or the instrument by which you experience it and then the object of that experience. Um, and what is being experienced in the manner in which it is being experienced. So, um, so when we talk about a pleasant and unpleasant and neutral feeling, uh, positive, negative, neutral feeling, then it is the object of the feeling, what is being felt. So then there is the subject feeling, aspect of the feeling, and that is this receptivity to what kind of feeling that might be encountered. So when we say the omnipresent mental factors, feeling in that context, it is the subjective component part of that feeling, which is this receptivity to whatever feeling may it encounter, whatever experience it may encounter. So, I don't know if you share it. 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 You share それで so his own feeling is that when we talk about Vedana or feeling in the context of the five omnipresent mental factors that are present so it is this subjective component. So of course, when the when it experiences whatever feeling tone it experiences, it 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 takes that shape or it takes that form. But conceptually, still you can make a distinction between a subjective aspect and the objective aspect of the actual experience. So, for example, when we uh, conceptualize an act, so there is an object of action, there is the actual act itself, then then there is the agent. So conceptually, one needs to make a distinction, but in actual fact, it may be the one and the same thing sometimes. So with this, I would like to uh, make a break, a tea break, and then we gather again in 15 minutes. Thank you. The question regarding what is emotion, I would like to bring it quickly back to Rupert to make a small addition and then we can maybe go over to Mathieu because he has an idea about positive, negative and neutral emotions. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to add that um, I think that maybe the fact that there is no obvious word um, for emotion in, uh, say, Pali or in Tibetan, coming from Sanskrit, for, for this word, this concept emotion, may be a little bit of a, 
um, red herring. Um, it, it, it's not really, it doesn't really tell us anything. It sometimes seems to me that it's taken as implying that in Abhidhamma um, and in the list of so-called mental factors, um, emotion is, is not included. But um, in fact, um, all the, I, I mean, just as in, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the Sanskrit dramatic theory, they have this later word that they have emotion, and they, list a, they give a list of eight things that have emotion, rasa and, and these bhava. All of them are in, a, in practice included in the list of chaita uh, in both Theravada and uh, Abhidharma Kosha. So we have. Trijatande, um, let me translate Tante. Pyogeta, Palita, and Sanskrit, Mabatiki, and Misekia, Tanya, Kohor, maybe Kitchen in those, Bennett, Sanskrit, and Chasha, and a jail, and a Nyam Kuyurva. So, within the Abhidhamma, we have emotions, uh, we have anger, joy, friendliness, envy, and, and so forth. So all those things are there. Um, I think it's also important that th th there's a tendency in uh, Abhidhamma, I think, to want to separate feeling from emotion. So feeling is something very, very simple. A any experience we have can either register as pleasant, I like it, unpleasant, I dislike it, neutral, I'm not sure what I think about this. And the point is then that feelings can be then associated with what would be considered kusala, wholesome emotions, or akusala, unwholesome emotions. So I can have a pleasant feeling uh, when I'm sitting uh, greedily eating my meal. That is pleasant feeling, but with the emotion of greed. I can also have a pleasant feeling when I am uh, sitting, talking to someone, um, and the conversation is friendly. Uh, then there is pleasant feeling associate, associated with um, adosa, friend, friendliness, metta. Um, so I think there is quite a lot in Abhidhamma, in effect, about emotion. You know, when I suggested that it wasn't there, it was certainly not at all to imply that emotions aren't discussed, but simply that category, that category of emotions, none of the emotions. And I say, I'm still not very, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm perhaps asking for too much because the clarity is not present already, but just the, the notion of signaling what is significant and not significant. This is not a debate, it's not comparing one system to another, but I'm thinking of a data an a analyst simply going through some numbers and for his particular agenda, he says, well, this is noise, but this is significant da data. And utterly dispassionate, he might almost be bored to death. He's been doing this for three hours and yes, significant data, and sig not insignificant. And would you, and th I'm sim this is really simply a question, but is that still a motion? Well, I think, you know, I this is working. So I, I think now we're playing on the, the meaning of the word significant as opposed to the meaning yeah. of the word emotion. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't think anything that's significant in any context means it's emotional. Yeah, okay. um, but you know, it is the case. I mean, we try to say what holds all these things together, this signaling system that is emotion. Mm -hmm. It's somehow telling you that this is important to you. 
more now, existentially, like for, for your well-being, your survival. Yes, and that, yes. Whether this is just your job exactly. of getting $10 an hour. Yes, exactly. Okay, that's much clearer. Yeah, there can be a lot of confusion about the word positive, negative, uh, constructive, destructive. So we had a whole minor life meeting on emotion, and subsequently, Richie Allen and Paul Ekman, which also tried to sort that out. So just in a nutshell, because we speak a lot of pleasant, unpleasant, positive, negative. Uh, when we say often in, psycholo in psychology, positive and negative is going towards something or averting or moving away from something. Of course, in Buddhist context, positive will be more happiness and negative more suffering or less happiness. So in that sense, we would say that the positive emotion is constructive toward flourishing and well-being, while another one is destructive. So it has nothing to do with attraction, I mean, in a way, with pleasant and unpleasant, because a, a, as just said, a very pleasant ex momentary experience leading to hedonic happiness may in the end cause a lot of suffering, mm -hmm. while sadness, for instance, which are very unpleasant, at the same time could be compatible with sukha, which is a way of being, of being strong, free, within, compassionate, and all that, a sense of orientation in existence, which is compatible with genuine, uh, a demonic happiness. So that's why we more use constructive and destructive emotion than positive and negative. And pleasant and unpleasant is quite superficial because uh, they could lead either way to suffering or happiness. Yes. So that's why uh, we need to unpack all those in, in, from both perspectives. I, I agree completely, and I think, it, it, as I mentioned briefly before, it's a real hindrance to Western science that we aren't being more clear about what we mean when we say emotion, because because as, just as I did today, because that's the, the tradition, you know, we say emotion does X, and it certainly isn't just emotion. There's more to it than that, and the fact that our language isn't, um, isn't meeting our conceptual understanding not that that would be easy to do, but it could be better than it is, I think is, is, is preventing us from thinking about these things in a detailed way that might be helpful. Richie, you had something you wanted to add? Uh, I, I just wanted to make one additional <coughs> distinction that was relevant to Alan's uh, question, uh, and that is that <clears throat> there are systems in the mind and the brain for detecting emotional cues or emotional stimuli in our environment. Uh, and there are other systems for, uh, related systems for actually generating an emotion. And those are not necessarily the same thing. Uh, and so we can detect that a, uh, an event or a stimulus is potentially significant, but that doesn't necessarily engender an emotional response in, in a person. Uh, the generation of an emotional response may be particularly important for motivating action, uh, but that is from the perceptual process of detecting significant events. And, and just to add to what you said, Lebe Chashele, Lebe Chashele, the emotionally important, important, unimportant. Then we see that they are level chances or less. They are level chances. Chile, emotion, get you got there. They will be level chances or less. They need the, they are cheap in money, but they are Emotion, get you got there. You got, you got, tango, tango, tango. Tango, that emotionally important. So, so the catch is on. We see that. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Because I'm not. Ah. So we did touch upon this, uh, you know, question of complexity of the processes when something like this, something like an emotion arises. So it's not just one thing that happens. And there are also a lot of um, kind of, you know, implicit influences. So Yohani, when you are in these discussions with science and in, with, let's say, with the Western notion of emotion, how do you conceptualize emotion coming from a tradition that has a different approach? Or as okay with that. <laughs> no clarity. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so still, in a state of confusion or ignorance, so that brings more curiosity to listen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> This, because of that, this, this explanation, this explanation, like that. 
Oh, yes. I, I think that uh, the, the points that both Mathieu and, and Rupert made regarding Rupert's distinction between feeling and emotion uh, and Mathieu's emphasis on wholesome and unwholesome, I think this represents a very important challenge for Western conceptions of emotion in, in psychology and neuroscience. And um, uh, we've been talking with you, Your Holiness, for many years about these issues. Uh, and um, it's slowly uh, uh, infiltrating mainstream psychology and neuroscience, but it's still the case that in our experiments, in the experiments of most Western scientists who are studying emotion, the fundamental categories are um, categories that are still, I think, confounding wholesome and unwholesome because a positive feeling, as we heard, can arise in the context of an unwholesome situation or a wholesome situation. And that distinction, I think, may be crucial to the brain. Uh, and uh, uh, that, is, that may help actually resolve some of the ambiguities in our own research. Uh, and I think that we need to take this dimension more seriously in the research that is being done in, in Western um, emotion science. Yeah, <laughs> So ju just to follow up on what Richie said, I think, you know, if it's important in behavior, you know, I'll, I'll take it a step further. It definitely is going to be somehow represented in the brain in a way we can see. But I think the challenge for, the, for us scientists is to find a way to really define the concepts, what we mean, you know, wholesome, unwholesome, and how we can verify that. Because for us, we have to understand the behavior and the psychological construct and be able to measure it before we can actually say anything about the brain. Um, and this is, I think, in emotion, a huge challenge. Our, our ability to discuss it and conceptualize it and talk about the subtlety goes way beyond our ability to manipulate it and assess it and quantify it. Um, and I think we're going to have to find a way to, to bridge that a little bit more before we're really going to get a hold of this in terms of the brain function. So His Holiness's own personal feeling is that when we are doing science, uh, basic science, analyzing what the mental processes uh, are, investigation, investigation uh, in that, on that level, he's wondering whether this evaluation of wholesome, unwholesome is actually a good thing or a bad thing, or is relevant. It, is it even, yeah. Uh, relevant. Of course, uh, that is separate from uh, uh, the other question, which is very scientifically open as well, which is to try to understand those types of emotions which we agree to be wholesome and what their behavioral expressions are and their effects and so on, and what, how are they expressed at the brain level. Mm -hmm. And those emotions which we generally recognize to be unwholesome, what their expressions are, what their behavioral outcomes are. That is, of course, a scientific question of investigation. Then I think another thing, the demarcation, wholesome, unwholesome, uh, not based on our uh, concept. Mm. But you see, research, those emotions which bring inner peace, calm mind, and also as a result, the physical action, the verbal action become more peaceful, more nice. That brings more happiness on others' mind. Uh, and also, ultimately, very positive has the impact in our body 
then we describe that is wholesome. <laughs> oh, those emotions uh, immediately disturb our inner peace, and as a result, expression harsh words. Yeah, harsh words. Uh -huh. That also brings more uncomfortable on other, including animals, and ultimately very harmful for body. Yeah. Then we d have a demarcation. Yeah, demarcation red. That's how the demarcation uh, should be. That then consider unwholesome. Uh -huh. So now, here, I think very complication, very complicated. complicated. The uh, in human mind, I think the justice, truthful, not double color face. No. No. That also, I think by nature, even to some extent, the animal also is appreciate your honest or honesty. honesty. Uh, so that also, I think, involve uh, something brings some satisfaction or inner peace, but actually uh, go against with justice, honesty. No. So uh, ultimately, that brings some uncomfortable, deep insight. So that should use it in, 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 the in the category of unwholesome. unwholesome. Although brings some pleasant, Pleasure. For the pleasure, no. for the moment, some peace of mind, maybe. Satisfaction. No. Uh, satisfaction. Uh, but ultimately, it may increase some uncomfortable. So that uh, should bring unwholesome. unwholesome no. And other, temporarily, a little bit uncomfortable. But still, you have truthful or Conviction. Oh, there's no need to take to, 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 to double say double, double, double stand, double stand. Double stand. That brings you inner strength. Clear. So I think complicated. These things are complicated. So the point is how do we draw the line between wholesome versus unwholesome? It should not be contingent entirely upon how it feels, but a sense of fairness and justice also need to play a role in that determination. <laughs> So uh, it, there is a, a wonderful summary in the Bodhisattva um, precepts um, on the trainings of the Bodhisattva where it says that uh, uh, so, um, um, and, and the, in summary, it says the Bodhisattvas should uh, act in the following. Um, even if it is painful to you, if it Lord is... Lord is Lord. Lord. So having explained all the specifics of the precepts in the preceding section, and then there is a summary point where it says that the Bodhisattvas should act in the following. Uh, even if it is uh, painful to you, if it is... So first, um, he should engage in actions that are and beneficial and joyful. Try to pamper, pull it down. So it's um, um, beneficial in the short term and leading to happiness in the long term. So even if it is painful, um, if it is beneficial, one should do it. So the idea here is that in, in the short term, even if it leads to some form of suffering, if in the long run it's leading to happiness, one should do it. Uh, so uh, even it feels pleasant, if it is unhelpful, um, um, then one should not do it. If it is hurtful, it sh one sh harmful, one should not do it. The here is again, mm. in the immediate it may seem pleasurable, but if it is hurtful in the long term, a, a long run one should not do it. I think that, I think that was the that the concept that I think cover all I think for the universal value can pay to So you would also of course tie in ethics into all that. This is the ethics layung or was ethics and pashi go mata. That D that have the ethic. No but and ethics those. Um well it's that's not the way to look at this. 
the way to look at it is to actually... There's no absolute ethic. e ethics, yeah. It's no not, absolute good. Yeah. <laughs> it's not the case that you have first a set of ethics and then you bring it into your uh, understanding of what is wholesome and what is unwholesome, <coughs> but rather it's the other way around. You analyze the mental reality and find which is harmful and helpful, beneficial. Long run. Long run. Well, well. And then on the basis of understanding that, then the summary kind of conclusion would be the ethics. But it's not, it's not the case that you are bringing ethics into the investigation of reality. Of course, that's Buddhist viewpoint. <laughs> Buddhist viewpoint. Buddhist approach. No. Uh, Buddhist approach. Right. Buddhist approach. No. Buddhist approach. No. Some of the atheistic sort of uh, tradition. A little, a little different. Okay, we must respect that. <laughs> Matthew? So as you see from his earnest, actually there are ways to investigate that. And you can say short and long term, you can say the search of fluctuating hedonic pleasure or happiness, and the more deeper way of being of a demonic happiness. So this criteria can be applied, and not a dogmatic ethic of good and evil, but embedded contextual human-related situation of what brings suffering and happiness. So those are not vague ideas. I mean, we can really, if we see it from that perspective, I mean, there are, there are ways to uh, then consider emotion by their impact. I had given Adele first. Um, I, I want to make a comment and then say what I w what wanted to say. Um, the comment is that I think that Your Holiness has given us a way to look at it that makes it less complicated. Because you say, look at the effect on the body over the years. And that gives us an objective way to do it. So you have made it much less complicated. Thank you. Um, what, I, what I was going to say, though, is um, there are other ways that are really important about how thought and language affects emotion to reduce suffering. And I thought that it would be helpful to mention this. Um, uh, uh, Jamie Pennybaker has worked with people in communities that go through horrific events, like a terrible flood or an earthquake, things like that. And he's asked people to just keep a journal, to just write about their experiences and their emotions. And he finds that that reduces their stress improves their psychological well-being, but also improves their physical well-being. Now, we, you know, many people will say if you go to a therapist or you talk to somebody who listens compassionately, but that's more complicated because you're also getting all the good things that come from the interaction. This eliminated the interaction. You're just putting it into language, and that in itself change the way it's represented in the brain, the way it's experienced in the body and the mind. We know that it's much better to have a good attachment with your mother, your parents, than an insecure attachment. An insecure attachment leads to suffering later. But they've shown in studies that if you can come up in language with a coherent understanding of what happened when you were little with your mother, not making it right, not making it uh, justifying it, but just coming up with some understanding of it. The outcome of people with an insecure attachment are just as good in adulthood as those with a secure attachment. And the last thing I wanted to mention is that it looks like the way this happens is that the prefrontal cortex dampens down the amygdala, as if the amygdala is kind of a fire alarm that keeps, you know, saying stress, stress, you know, and you're not able to come up with some coherent way of addressing it. And just putting things into language changes how the brain deals with it and affects our psychological well-being and our physical well-being. I just wanted to mention that. And the Susan Yonga did Tem Tanje, Tepnal, Shuman, Tibet, Chipoki, Kesu, Kawashim Dutus. Express, express, Chetuk, that the Pichi prefrontal kit that sometimes the Dutuba, Digi Pa, and the Mingtel, there's Shuchun Times or Shikeda Mas and Chun Times. Diego, can I just step out, out of the interpreter's role and just make a simple point? Absolutely. Because the, the discussion came up about why there is this big sort of contrast between the Eastern. 
uh, classical Indian tradition versus the West with regard to whether or not there is a specific term for emotion and what that suggests. And here, perhaps, since we don't have Sean, I could play the philosopher's role. <laughs> and, uh, and also, one thing that is important sometimes is to bring the historical perspective. One thing that we have to understand is that Western science grew out of Greek thought. And this kind of dichotomy between passions and reason has been a very important ancient heritage of Western thought. And it, the concept of emotion as a separate kind of an entity has its root in this Plato's distinction between the three components of the soul where passion has an important role. And there's a, often a conflict between passion and reason. Perhaps that may have been an important basis. And that kind of dichotomy was never really articulated in the, in the Eastern context. Can I respond to that? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can I just, Can I respond? Yeah, this. So I, I think you're absolutely correct. And I think we see this now a lot when we talk about decision making. So in some of the neuroeconomic research that I've been getting into more and more, there's been this talk about emotion and cognition as two competing systems in the brain. Um, and I think this is not a very sophisticated approach, but it's almost like in trying to talk about the approach where emotion integrates in many different complex ways, um, you know, is such a hard hurdle to overcome in Western science because of such a, this strong tradition that I think comes from the early philosophical writings about passion and reason being two opposing forces as opposed to interacting forces to allow us to arise at the correct conclusion. Make one point and then I'll pass it on to Dave. Uh, I just want to make one point about this, which is I think that most neuroscientists today would agree that the brain does not respect the dichotomy that was handed to us by the Greek tradition. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to bring attention back at least briefly to the notion of beneficial in the long term. <laughs> so there are many people in the world and often on occasion one is confronted with a situation where one can make a decision such that by taking act one, many people will be, be benefited somewhat. Their suffering will go down and their happiness will go up. But in contrast, one might make another decision instead that will improve the situation of fewer people, but to a greater extent. I might make a decision such that I can create enlightenment in a much smaller group of people while the suffering and uh, is, is worse and the happiness is uh, less for the rest of the people. So you have a situation that involves a moral dilemma. Suppose there is a man on a bridge and I'm standing next to him and if I push him off the bridge I can save five people down below because his body will stop a train that's about to run into five people <laughs> down below who don't see the train coming. <laughs> what should I do? Should I sacrifice the life of the one man in order to increase the happiness of the five down below? How do I resolve all of this according to uh, the precepts of Buddhism, compassion, and so forth uh, when I'm deliberating this and there's only two seconds to decide whether or not to push? <laughs> <laughs> I think sometimes we have to think it very seriously from the theoretical viewpoint and the practical viewpoint. Sometimes there is sort of the contradictions. Contradiction or conflict now. So using our common sense on the case, uh, case by case. Case by case. And that's important. And the Jujuna di Hudua. Um, in fact, uh, in Shantideva's text, there is um, 
uh, basically a um, point raised that in the end, uh, how one acts in a given situation. Uh, um, so how one acts in a given situation um, is, you know, is that a person should really weigh what is the most appropriate thing to do in the end. Because there is going to be conflicts. And uh, Shantideva says that use your knowledge and act accordingly. <laughs> Uh, from a theoretical viewpoint, from the theoretical point of view in Buddhism, in fact, there is a uh, discussion of this problem. And there is a story of uh, a Bodhisattva um, who was um, a captain, uh, captain of a ship. Oh, one, one of the previous oh, um, sort of life of, of the Buddha. Buddha. And in this ship, there was a murderer who was going to commit an act of killing all the passengers on the ship. And in order to save all the passengers, he had to kill this. Uh, 999. No, oh. no 999 passengers. So in order one, to 1,000 uh, people on the ship, yeah. A group of people, yeah. 1,000. And out of 1,000, one person thinking to eliminate the rest of the people then all the belongings or possess, yeah. you see. He could take them, yeah. yeah. So then the Buddha's, so the previous, previous, life. Uh, previous life is that. Then you see, judge, uh, killing, uh, generally, I mean, uh, one killing, uh, killing many, both bad. Negative one. Must avoid. <laughs> but now there's no other choice. Mm -mm. One person, determined to kill the rest of his companion. Uh, he gave several warnings, but he never sort of, sort of dropped Drop. that, that sort of plan. plan. Then uh, that person, you see, the calculate, if I kill this one person in order to save 999 person's life. Uh, now here, important thing is, if he let that person Killed 999 uh, people, then this person will get sin, killing, right? negative karma, no. negative karma, or 999 uh, people, Murders, or, right? or, I mean, killing of 999 people. Oh. If he, the Buddha's previous life, if he killed this person, he got the sin, but uh, ju one. just so, killing one. No. Then, most important, so, uh, so from so here you may have a situation where the Bodhisattva, in order to protect, save this uh, potential murderer from committing a negative karma of killing 999 people, he willingly took upon himself the act of killing this one individual and taking the karmic consequences of that one murder. So here, in a sense, what you, we have is a form of giving and taking, Tonglen practice. Yes. So now to follow up on this, uh, David, your point, earlier I cited that summary from a particular text after having listed all the Bodhisattva precepts. I did leave out one final line which says that for whose heart is pure or virtuous, and there is no sin, <laughs> there, is, there is no fault. So ultimately it depends on one's own ultimate motivation. motivation. Sincere compassion, sincere sense of concern of others' well-being. Usually, it's this demarcation, right and good, is usually is based on our egoistic attitude. This is someone who thoroughly so, trained the egoistic attitude, diminish, 
full of compassion, sense of concern of the rest of the others, and transcendent yeah. being, then uh, acoustic tone, the right or wrong, shesha, the ring minuata. So for that individual, then the demarcation that is normally drawn between what is right and wrong from a sort of a self centered perspective no longer applies. The Guruji Mitabi may sumjare. Nume vesesh. Mm-hmm. So, uh, in fact, there is a, a, a statement in Dotup Jingme Tembe Nima, great Dzogchen master uh, of uh, early 20th century, um, where he says that uh, in the context of discussing uh, matters at the level of uh, fundamental innate mind of clear light, don't bring in conversations that are on the level of coarse everyday consciousness. <laughs> oh. So in this, in, in relation to this, in Shantideva's uh, text, uh, uh, Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life, Bodhicharya Avatara, uh, where he says that, talking about Bodhisattva's um, uh, ethics, he says that uh, uh, given the far-sightedness of the great compassionate Buddhas, even those that have been Conventionally prohibited uh, from a, you know, conventional norms were permitted to the Bodhisattvas. That count again, the count to the Nyal Miti Chanju Semj Gonda. Chanju Semj Yana, any Tazu Yaojidu. So, in the case of this ethical dilemma, the ethical dilemma that you presented of the person who was standing up on the bridge and, you know, wondering whether he should push this other person down. Uh, first of all, that person needs to have a, a, a cultivated bodhicitta, this altruistic, uh, you know. <laughs> then uh, oh, then pure, he will be able to know what to do. That motivation, <laughs> then okay. <laughs> Whatever he done, okay. How's that? And so you demand a Quran chana degrees. That's an option too. <laughs> Sure, sure, sure. When, the, when, they, when they ask that question in the lab about that dilemma, they say you cannot jump yourself, you have to mm. push or not. Yeah. But in real life, as he's always said, then you would jump yourself. That's the only no, way. No, but generally the ethical dilemma is where the person who's standing next to you is large enough so that that yeah. weight of that person can block. Whereas yeah, if you to jump, yeah, not that's the, to, jump you know, to finish the, the to really finish the so? scenario. No, that was the idea. Yes. That was the idea. <laughs> that, you cannot Someone like say 100 percent. Ultimately, motivation. <laughs> that you can see. Oh. Hey, Chidan, then the ethical dilemma Quran just shares on. Oh, the kuzu keje ma mushe gor. That di she vekalia. So if the person happens to be someone quite large, that that means he ought to jump himself. (laughs) 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 Alan, you wanted to make a comment? Yeah. We have this enormous term emotion that is so prominent in our Western, ever going back to Plato. The term that, uh, that is so dominant, central, in Buddhist understanding of the mind, that we've not really unpacked much yet, is the word klesha in Sanskrit. And I would suggest it's, it's often translated, I've often translated as mental affliction, but in my conversation with Bob Thurman just last night, it's not simply a feeling of being afflicted, but rather it's a tendency of the mind, a process of the mind, that gives rise to affliction. So more of an afflictive tendency. Mm-hmm. The definition of this in Tibetan, well, I forget the Tibetan, is it's a mental process that disturbs the equilibrium or upsets the peace of the mind. Now, as Ahonet has often commented, that when you experience very strong compassion, very strong compassion, you don't feel really peaceful. The mind is certainly aroused. You wouldn't say I'm feeling you know, serenity at that time. But it's a reality-based disequilibrium, a, a reality-based arousal. And so therefore, even though the surface is disturbed, at core, it's very grounded, and there is a deep equilibrium. 
But I think this raises a very rich interface with cognitive neuroscience, psychology. Uh, and to take an example, loving kindness is a virtue. It's not a mental affliction. But, and we cultivate this through meditation. And what it is is a very genuine, heartfelt caring and yearning that oneself, others, may experience genuine happiness and the causes of happiness. But now there are false facsimiles, things that one can very easily oneself mistake for loving kindness. And so one may be practicing loving kindness meditation and just feel a very pleasant feeling. Ah, it's really sweet. And think that's loving kindness. It's not, it's just a feeling. But more pernicious than this is that one may mistake it for something that is really self-centered gratification, as in sexual, sexual love, sexual infatuation. I love you so much, I can't live without you. Here, I have all this stuff. And one I see, feel so much love for this person. In fact, it's not loving kindness at all. It's a mental affliction of craving. It's all about my gratification. Take one other example, but this does lead to a question, and that is compassion. Compassion also is not simply a feeling, it's not simply empathy or sadness for the other, but rather a profound yearning. May you be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. Once again, that's a, that's a virtue, but there are false facsimiles. For example, moral indignation. Moral indignation, when one sees a victimizer. Uh, moral indignation. Uh, and one feels very moral indignation, moral righteousness, that I'm so outraged and I'm feeling so compassionate, completely conflate these things. Whereas in fact it may be really a, the, the afflictive tendency of anger, but manifesting in the guise from a first person is I'm feeling tremendously compassionate and therefore I'm going to write a big check, but it's really all about anger. But the, the false facsimile that's, that's classically presented in the Theravada scriptures is actually despair is despair. And that is, one looks at the world of suffering and feels tremendous sadness. And so, what would be so interesting, I think, as, as the Buddhists are seeking to get help from the scientific community, not simply have interesting conversation, and that is, we are easily deluded as we are trying to assess our own practice. And is this genuine loving kindness? Is this genuine compassion? Is my mind right now, has it succumbed to an afflictive tendency or not? Right? Uh, it would be marvelous to know what parts of the brain are being activated in genuine loving kindness as opposed to simply self-centered attachment and gratification and so on. Do you think this is feasible or is it just way too subtle for cognitive neuroscience to access? So, so I have yeah, to... Did you say that? No, yes. Uh, uh, some kind of a closeness feeling uh, out, of, out of sort of sexual, uh, very close sort of feeling to his friend. That you should call biased mm. and very much sort of because they're related with equal my friend uh, my wife my husband like that so that uh, because biased that kind of sort of closeness feeling or sense of concern never extend towards your enemy mm. now genuine compassion is not based on oh, something good for me, not that way. But the those sentient beings who have the experience of pleasure or pain, just like myself, who do not want suffering, yet is passing through suffering. So on that because on that on recognition. that on that recognition, develop sense of concern. Now that not sort of because of the concern whether other sort of attitude towards yourself, friendly or negatively. It doesn't matter. Your enemy, also sentient being, also has every right, just like me, uh, to overcome this suffering. So, from that way, it's a developed sense of concern, compassion. That is unbiased, genuine compassion. That kind of compassion only comes through training. The other type of biased compassion it's a biological factor. Mm -hmm. So like that. That I think I think we can we can we can make distinction. distinction then. So then another thing. The genuine unbiased compassion which come from training reasons, there is solid basis. So full confidence, inner strength. The other one the can go with fear. Hated, some other sort of negative kind of emotion, or no. also you see, I think very much involved. Involved. 
and much sort of, I think, oriented at others' attitude. The other one, not on the attitude, but the being. So big differences. <laughs> so one day, I think our specialist, you see, did brain turning. Yeah, which you are saying, oh, that the chamber, because of the chamber, the one that is delicious, unbiased delicious. <laughs> so, you know, ideally it would be a nice situation if we can reach a point where neuroscientists can, looking at the brain, say, okay, so this is a biased form of compassion and this is a biased, unbiased form of compassion. Then, then through that way, I think most important, which is a, uh, I, I, uh, I really is want, is, oh, that unbiased compassion is really good for our health. Oh. The bias of compassion is bad for our health. Then we can educate the rest of the six billion human beings. Everybody take care of health. health. Oh. I do without pay much sort of attention about because of the doctor. Oh. Then the doctor becomes jobless. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what, what did you want to answer? You... With your list. <clears throat> so I was going to say to Alan, <clears throat> excuse me, I think prior to getting at the place where we can look at the brain and tell these things, we need to know how, to, how, how we could identify it without looking at the brain. That's the most important thing. Because once we can be sure that we're identifying these differences without looking at the brain, then we can go into the scanner and try to see what the differences are in the brain. Um, and then I, I think Richie wants to follow up, but I have a question. But I'd like just to respond just very briefly to that. And yeah. that is, the onus is back on the meditators yeah. and the Buddhists. Mm -hmm. And that is to p have people, whether Buddhist, Christian, I don't care, or not religious, but really spending the time as scientists of the mind, mm -hmm. training compassion. And so in relationship with your teacher, who hopefully is an expert, getting more and more people who have rigorously and in a sustained fashion trained in loving kindness, trained in compassion, so that there's a lot of confidence from the first person side. This really is it. Then get the brain scan mm -hmm. and then find the facsimiles and so forth. Mm -hmm. This would be really a tremendously rich interface. Well, you, uh, if, if I understand your holiness correctly, uh, in unbiased compassion there really should be uh, the cultivation of mm. the of the compassion, the wish for um, uh, for uh, suffering to be eliminated and the causes of suffering in in all beings, including those with whom one may disagree or with whom conflict uh, uh, arises. And so, this presents, I think, a very <coughs> tractable uh, um, set of methods for us as scientists. So we can, for example look to see uh, if even a simple thing is presenting pictures of people with whom may, one may have some difficulty. Pictures of, say, George Bush. Um, <laughs> uh, maybe, uh, uh, and see whether the same feeling of uh, uh, behavioral as well as brain signatures of compassion arise in response to all individuals. That's something that is, um, uh, is, is potentially tractable. And the other um, issue is one of clinging. It seems that, unbi that biased compassion is associated with clinging. Uh, and I think that there are ways that we can begin to um, get measures of clinging, both behaviorally as well. <laughs> Even at the brain level, oh. clinging? Well, uh, yes, even at the brain level. And so, um, yeah, I, 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 I certainly think it's possible. We know that um, uh, there are um, studies in addiction, for example, where there's very strong clinging and craving uh, that is measurable in the brain. Well, just uh, on the on the way to the other, you monk is labor with that. That is the reason that you monk are to You monk are living to that curl rushing again, Russian that Zimba that Tenzin said that Dick is the labor that Tungzin the Tenzin said the daddy. Pay your best house, that is me or something. Round in on Sashane, Tower Taraga Wangi. Uh, and 
So given that uh, we are talking about now a way of measuring and observing the effects of the uh, glacier, um, I, I'm still going to stick with my afflictions <coughs> rather than afflictive tendencies. Um, six hours to both them crying affliction malaise, afflictive tendencies. You want to be attached to your questions? So, uh, since we are now talking about ways of measuring and observing and testing um, what constitutes an afflicted state and unafflicted state and so on, um, another confounding factor is actually, um, again, um, the element of grasping. Um, and, uh, and what constitutes a valid, kind of in a veridical state of mind, and what constitutes a distorted state of mind, even within the Buddhist tradition, uh, depending upon how subtle your understanding of reality is, how subtle your view of reality is, what ultimate reality, ultimate reality is, what may seem to be a veridical state of mind in one philosophical mm. school may turn out to be non-veridical and distorted from another perspective. So it, this is a confounding um, factor in this. I can translate, mm. translate a little bit more. So Igosadi so for example, um, one of the key elements in many of these afflicted mental states is their rootedness in one way or another to some form of egocentrism or self-centered uh, attitude or perspective. So again, this re question about self-regarding or some sort of self-identity, uh, what constitutes a distorted form and what constitutes uh, a kind of an um, undistorted form will depend very much on how you understand the nature of self or ident personal identity to be. Um, so for example, if your uh, identity of yourself is premised upon some belief in some kind of enduring reality uh, to your own person, then that kind of attitude you know, and ego becomes distorted because there is no basis. You, there is a grasping to some kind of permanence. On the other hand, you have a self-identity that is simply uh, taking self or a person to be a kind of a, a nominal reality, like a kind of a case holder. And then, of course, any reference that you make to that kind of identity will not be a form of distorted uh, self-view. So, of course, all of these uh, uh, issues come up. Of course, that's from Buddhist viewpoint. Oh, right. okay. uh, so, is the one Buddhist, I think, very, very unique Buddhist sort of concept is anatma. No self, no. No self. So that's the connection now here. So usually, uh, not much is the connection when we drink, when we sort of you know, lunch. You say the the concept of no non-self is no relevant. <laughs> but when we think deeper way, deeper way about the self-centered sort of attitude, grasping, or well, then this concept is very much relevant. Relevant. There's a little bit more that was untr untranslated, and that was his holiness was speaking about any type of mental affliction. I'm going to stick with that too for the time yeah. being, <laughs> knowing that it's an afflictive tendency of the mind. I'm going to call it for short, mental affliction. That for any of them, whether it's craving or attachment, there's going to be an underlying reification of the object that one is grasping onto as being intrinsically desirable, intrinsically undesirable. And so this is where one grasps onto it as something inherently existent, something more tangible, substantial than, remember our earlier conversation when I said, is Rupert here? Oh yes, in a manner of speaking, I see Rupert, he's right over there. It's in a manner of speaking, it's just, it's just that, it's nothing more. I'm not seeing some inherently existent uh, ego, a person over there, who has a body, has a mind, but just in a manner of speaking. But when the craving or hostility as mental afflictions arise, what they, they tend to really grasp and reify, yes. taking out of context. So George Bush, not seeing all of the influences <laughs> that, that have come and give rise to his behavior, just the real George Bush. 
And that no. then becomes the independent, object. Independent, absolute. Yeah. Yeah. Independent, absolute, an object of profound craving and attachment for some people. <laughs> Mathieu, I sure. wanted to say that there's already an uh, experimental approach to precisely try to distinguish the different components of compassion. And preliminary work with Tanya Singer and Richie's lab, for instance, to distinguish empathy, which is the resonance with other suffering, sensitivity to it, and suffering because of other suffer. And then when you add from the contemplative perspective, unconditional compassion and loving kindness. There is an experiential difference, an experimental difference, so it's already getting into the components of compassion. Liz, you had a last question. So, I, um, Your Holiness, I wanted to ask, in my, in my presentation I talked quite a bit about how emotion changes sensation and attention and memory, and I was wondering if there's anything in the Buddhist teachings that talks about a similar effect of emotion on things like sensation and attention and memory. Um, yeah. <coughs> No, it's what you, you have presented, uh, the impact. The kind of the mutual relationship between how emotion influences one's thoughts and behavior and so on, and how thoughts then in turn, um, you know, loops back and influences how one emotionally re react. Uh, this is 100%, you know, it's in, in some sense, it's actually a common sense. And it's very similar to the way Buddhists would understand. So in fact, uh, the experiments that you have done is very beneficial to the Buddhists to learn. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> There's a whole genre of meditation, of insight meditation, called the close application of mindfulness to phenomena, in which one is not looking at just one type of phenomena or another, but looking at the interactions from a first-person perspective of emotions, thoughts, influences, and so forth, and exactly looking at these type of interdependences, and especially looking for which types of processes, thoughts, and so forth, give rise to genuine happiness, and which ones are obstructing it. But that's very central to Buddhist meditation, insight meditation. <laughs> So one um, so, so one advantage of bringing the scientific perspective is that you have a way of visually um, uh, presenting your findings in the, in the Buddhist the context. We rely heavily on the words and the explanation and using the mind to try to, you know, kind of comprehension and, and kind of reasoning processes. Uh, there is, however, been a recognition that visual representation is important. For example, even the Buddha himself and developed this, um, the wheel of life, uh, which you know, presents visually the 12 links of interdependent origination that portrays the birth of a, a sentient being uh, in, in the cycle of existence. And then also there is um, uh, a chart that maps out the nine stages of attentional development uh, you know, associated with shamatha. So, but these are very kind of one or two very minor attempts to visually represent. But science, of course, brings a very rich and powerful representation that can be shown visually. So eventually we introduce, right? so, somebody uh, introduced, introduced in our as a class. Yeah. And particularly those young uh, students, students, I think very helpful. I, I think very helpful. Yes. Uh, good. Yes. So we break for lunch and dedicate ourselves to grasping to food, maybe not too much, but enjoy. <laughs>